Routing fundamentals. So in this lecture, we're going to talk about the basics of routing and how information goes based off a logical address from one network to another. So for our routing fundamentals, what we're going to consider is how we route our traffic between different subnets or different networks. Every time you have a subnet, it's going to be on its own broadcast domain. So if we have two subnets or two virtual networks, VLANs, uh, we're going to have to route that traffic between the two. Routers are our layer three devices that separate our broadcast domains, uh, which we talked about earlier when we were talking about our different networks. And multi-layer switches, which are layer three switches, can also be used to separate broadcast domains and do functions like a router would. So the way our routing works, we want to know how does information get from something like PC1 to server1 in this diagram. And the way we're going to do that is it's going to be do doing that based off the source and destination IP addresses. So when we look at how the information is going to get from 192.168.1.2 in the upper left corner to 192.168.3.2 in the upper right corner, they're on two different networks. We have to route that traffic across uh, between routers 1 and 2. So first, PC1 needs to determine what the MAC address of the router is going to be. So it sends an ARP request inside its internal network, and it receives an ARP reply, and then it can forward its data frame using the local switching of the network to the router. So in this case, when he says, hey, I'm looking for uh, 192.168.3.2, the router is going to respond back and say, hey, I'm your gateway. I'm going to go ahead and answer that up for you as an ARP reply, and it will send the information to the router. Once the router gets that information, it's going to switch and start using the IP addressing to figure out which network it needs to go to. In this case, router1 gets the data frame from PC1 through the switch network. He looks at the IP header, and he determines that he doesn't own that network because he owns the 192.168.1.1 network here on Fast uh, Ethernet 00 interface. Since he doesn't, he's going to send out his default gateway, which in this case is this serial connection, over to router2. When he does that, he's going to decrease what we call the time to live by one and forward the information out. Router 2 is then going to get that information. And when it receives it, it's going to look based on the IP address and realize that it does own the 192.168.3.something network over here. And then where we're trying to get that information to is the server. So it sends out an ARP request to find out who owns the IP address of 192.168.3.2. And it responds back with the, uh, the MAC address for that server to the router. Once the router has that MAC address, it can then use the switch network to get the information back over to the server. So essentially what we did was we went from PC1 to router1. We had to go from layer 3 down to layer 2 to do it via switching. Once it gets to the router, it goes back up to layer 3 over to router 2. Once it gets to router 2, it's going to go back down to layer 2 with switching to get over to server 1. So with our routers, what they're really focusing on is our layer 3 to layer 2 mapping. We're going to use those ARP caches to map the IP addresses to a given MAC address inside their network. Routers are going to make their decisions based on packet forwarding based upon their internal router tables. And usually we're going to have a route called the default gateway as well, that if the router doesn't know where it goes, it's going to send it out that default gateway. So when we look at a routing table, the table is kept by the router to help determine which route the entry is going to be the best fit for the particular network. So in this particular router table on the left, you can see we have destination networks of 125.0.0.0. We have 161.5.0. And next to those, we'll have a different router that it would send to. So if I was sending something to the address of 125.1.1.1, it would go out port number one on this router because, and it would send it to the router of 137.3.14.2 because it matched that particular entry. But if I was sending information to the 210 network, it's going to go out this interface, interface 3, and go to that particular router. When we look at routers, it's always looking for the most specific route it can find. So if I have something like 10.1.1.0 slash 24, because that is subnetted down to only 256 IPs, it's more specific than just the 10.0.0.0 slash 8 network, which has 16 million IPs. So routers always want to be more specific as if possible because it has a better chance of getting that data to its destination quicker. So when we look at sources of routing information, there's lots of different ways that these routing tables are built. One of the ways they're built is by directly connected routes. And these are learned by having a physical connection between the routers. 
So in a couple of slides before, we showed router 1 and router 2 were connected via a serial cable. They had a serial connection. They were directly connected. And those would actually learn themselves based on that physical connection. Uh, static routes are used by a router when an administrator manually configures that router to have that route. Like I said before, we have the default static router, or the default gateway uh, is a special case. If I don't know where else to send it, I'm going to send it out to this default route. And the default route is always written as 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0. So if you notice in the diagram here to the left, you can see in this PC's routing table, it does have the default route. If you're working a problem and it can't get out to the internet, you want to check and make sure that the route is does have a default route set for it. Because if it doesn't, the PC won't know where to send things that it's not directly connected to. The last way we have things is what's called dynamic routing protocols. And we'll learn a lot about these later, but there's lots of different protocols where the routers can talk to each other and they can exchange information between routers. Things like OSPF, Open Shortest Path First, or BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, are examples of routing protocols. And there is our static route. So when I have a directly connected route, you can see in this diagram, I have two directly connected routes for each router. I have in the left router, I have fast ethernet A00, which is right here. It's the network for 192.168.1.0 on this interface. I also have the directly connected route here for 192.168.2.0 network slash 30 on this serial interface between the routers. This particular router is also on that same network, so it has the 192.168.2.0 network, and it has its own network of 10.1.1.0, which is up here connecting to the internet. So the router needs to understand how to reach its destination. Basically, it understands it because it is directly connected to the destination. So in this example, router 1 knows how to get to the 192 network because it's already connected to it on fast ethernet 00. For our static routes, these are going to be routes that are entered by our administrator. So as you notice in the table on the left, we added a single route here, the 0000. Dot, uh, slash 0 as a static route. And essentially what that's saying is, if I don't have the route in my table, in other words, it's not the 192.168.1.0 network or the 192.168.2.0 network, I'm going to send all other traffic out this network, which is on serial 1. So if this PC asks to go to anywhere except for its own network or this particular router, this router is going to send the traffic out to router 2. Router 2 also has a default route set up that says if it doesn't know where things are, send it out to the internet. And that's what that default route is going to do. This default static route is a special route that again states that if traffic is not destined for this network, send it out this interface and let somebody else deal with that problem. Last, we have those dynamic routes that we talked about. And more than one route can exist for a given network when we start dealing with dynamic routes. The different protocols will consider different criteria, also known as metrics, to decide which route is given preference. So in the diagram here to the left, you can see PC1 can get to the internet many different ways. PC1 can go down through the switch to router 3, over to router 2, and out to the internet. Or PC1 can go to router 3, router 4, router 2, and out to the internet or it can go router 3, router 1, router 2, and out to the internet. So we have three different paths. And the way PC1 and router 3 is going to make the decision of where to send the information is based off of whether it's, um, if you're using RIP, it'll use the number of hops, which is the number of routers in between it and the destination. If you're using OSPF, it might use the bandwidth. So in this case, if I was using RIP, what would end up happening is PC1 would send data. It would go from the switch to router 3 to router 2 and out because that would be the least amount of hops, it would only be two hops. Where if I went up to router one or router four, I would have three hops, right? But that's not gonna be the most efficient because as you can see between router three and router two, there's only 128 kilobit per second connection. It would be much faster to go from router three to router four to router two because you have a 10 megabit connection and a 512 meg uh, kilobit connection. So in this case, you have this one, which is five times uh, fast, or excuse me, four times faster than this connection. So by taking this route, even though there's an additional router step in between, it's still going to end up being faster. And that's what OSPF takes into account. Uh, static routing, while it's useful, it, it doesn't scale very well for large networks. If you think about your router, if you had to put in a network for every single website out there in the world, you'd be sitting there typing in routes forever. So we don't want to do that. Instead, we want to let the routers uh, configure themselves, and using these automatic protocols allow us to do that.
So one other thing we have to worry about is routing loops. Just like we talked about before when we had the shortest path first, uh, excuse me, STP, when we had our, our spanning tree protocol for switches to prevent those loops, we need to prevent routing loops. So in this diagram, we have routers 1, 2, and 3 all connected together. We could easily create a routing loop where they're all sending information to each other. But to prevent that, what we can do is either use split horizon or poison reverse. And what split horizon does is it prevents a route that's learned on one interface from being advertised back out that same interface. And I'll show you an example of what that looks like in a second. Uh, for poison reverse, it causes a route that's received on one interface to be advertised back out that same interface, but the metric it gives it is so high that no one would ever want to use it. Okay? So in this example here, I have a metric of 1, a metric of 2, and a metric of 10. Router 3 knows how to get to router 1 two different ways, right? It can get to it going directly to router 1, or it can go up through router 2 to router 1. Because the metric is lower here on metric 1 versus 10, router 3 is going to want to go 1 to 2 to get to router 1. What we do with poison reverse is we basically put an X in one of our interfaces, so we make sure that it doesn't learn a particular route and go that way. Um, and that's what we're going to end up doing. We're going to split the horizon here. And that'll help us prevent our routing loops. So in this example here, we have a network with no issues. You can see the two uh, router 2 and router 3's routing tables. In this case, we have uh, the 10.1.1.0 and 10.1.2.0 networks on serial 00, which is this side of the router. We have the 3.0 and the 4.0 network on this side of the router, because you can see this is the 3.0 and this is the 4.0 network. On router 3, serial 00, is how it would get to the 1.1 net network and the 2.0 network, excuse me, the 1.0 network and the 2.0 network. And the other serial interface here, <coughs> excuse me, the other interface is where we would get to the 1.4 network. Okay. Now, if a link went down, for instance, this link over here on router 3 for the network 4, router 3 gets the information on how to connect to router 4 from router 2 because router 2 knew how to get there before, if we look back at our table, router 2 says, hey, I know how to get to this network, the dot four network, it's out this interface, right? Well, router 3, when it goes down, it's going to learn that it can get to that network by going through router 2. But the problem is router 3 is going to go to router 2, and where's router 2 going to go? Back to router 3, because that's how it knew how to get there. And so we get this loop that happens between the two. And that's what you can see here. So what ends up happening is, since I no longer have this network, I'm going to end up realizing that I can go this way with a hop count of 1. This is going to become a chain reaction because now 2 is going to go, oh, router 3 knows how to get to 4.0 with a hop count of 1, so now my hop count is going to be 2. Because I'm going to go to 3 and 3 is going to send it to another person, not realizing that it's sending it back to itself. And so what ends up happening is we start going increment by 1, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, until the metric becomes so large that no router ends up wanting to use it. And so nobody now knows how to get to that particular network. And that is our basics of routing fundamentals.